Hello everybody, this is Danny Bobro, President of AIM Dental Marketing, welcoming you to this installment of the Practice Perfection Web-Based Education Series. Today's presentation is entitled, Integration of Oral Health with Medical Health, Implementation Strategies for Wellness Opportunities in the Restorative Dental Practice, and Networking Tools for Continuous Growth. As Stuart Smalley might have once said, it's a long title, but that's okay. It's appropriate. Having a standardized approach to the dental exam and a methodology for effective communication provides many opportunities to influence the overall health of your patients. This presentation outlines seven key foundational elements of the patient examination that capitalizes on those opportunities. The methodology creates an easy transition from just talking about and recommending reparative dentistry to discussing overall patient health. The knowledge base that is integration of oral health issues with medical health issues continues to evolve and expand. Getting started, keeping current, and continuing to grow that knowledge base is the challenge confronting many practitioners. Meeting this challenge head-on is the mission of the Wellness Dentistry Network. Dr. Thompson presents to us from the greater New Detroit area and is speaking about a topic he never dreamed he would, periodontal disease and the new direction his practice has taken since learning of the systemic relationship. He has been involved in dentistry for over 30 years and is a faculty member, clinical instructor, and past advisory board member at the Coyce Center in Seattle, Washington. He is the founder of the Wellness Dentistry Network a community of dentists with a desire to seek continuous knowledge about the integration of oral and overall health. The Wellness Dentistry Network provides the tools and methodology to assist general dentists and their teams to integrate wellness concepts and knowledge of them into everyday practice. These support materials assist with leadership, disease awareness and diagnosis, patient education, treatment, and disease maintenance. It provides information in 22 areas to assist in the development of the wellness practice. Using this unique diagnostic and communication approach, he has witnessed huge changes in the health of his patients, his practice, and the engagement of his support team. He has also developed great collaborative relationships with physicians. <coughs> Dr. Thompson's full biography is available online and is considerable, but we will just, in the interest of time, move on so we can get to today's event and very special presenter. I want you to know that Practice Perfection webcasts run for around 90 minutes. While attendees are in listen-only mode, we invite you at any time to submit your questions or comments using the question button on your screen. We will allow time following the presentation to get your questions answered. If that should not be possible during the webcast, we'll see that they're answered shortly thereafter. Those who view this presentation may also apply to receive one and a half hours of continuing education credit. Shortly after the webcast, you will receive instructions on how to receive your CE. Participants are cautioned about the dangers of incorporating techniques and procedures into their practices if the course has not provided them with adequate clinical experience to allow them to perform it competently. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome to the Practice Perfection stage, Dr. Douglas Thompson. Hello, Doug. Hi, Danny. How are you? Thank you so much. Great. You know, when we were in, thanks, Danny. When we were in dental school, this is what we learned to work on. We called it the somatonaphic system. And, you know, we thought it was just the teeth and maybe a temporal mandibular joint and a few muscles of mastication. And obviously, we wanted to perfect the system so people could speak and swallow and eat. However, when you start to look at it, and if you look at it in a little bit of detail, it's a very complex system. Additionally, and you're not supposed to be able to read that screen, but it just lets you know there's a lot of things going on in this whole system. Additionally, we've learned recently that new research supports that this oral health and the oral health issue may be uh, more uh, important than what we previously thought. And all of us that uh, have been studying this surely understand that. Uh, in practice, I started to really struggle with uh, what do I evaluate when I'm looking at this system? And, and when I do evaluate it, how do I record the results so that I can communicate it in a meaningful way to my patients and really state the significance of what's happening. And then I only have an hour and 15 minutes or an hour, uh, maybe an hour and a half sometimes for my new patient exam, so how do I do it efficiently? And then how do we keep it simple? 
because it can get very complex in a hurry when you start to think about all those pieces and how they fit together. So tonight what I hope to do is I want to outline some key elements of how I've broken down uh, our integrative oral medicine, that's the name of my practice, how we've broken down this dental examination. And, and how we've learned about health-related topics to spin off these key elements. And then what about some barriers? What about the barriers for some of you that might be thinking about implementing these concepts in practice? I want to identify and talk about some of those. And then I want to discuss some communication techniques that will create distinction for you. I think to the average consumer, a lot of us look the same. We just look like um, another repair shop. But if we create some distinction in our communication, it really allows us to stand out. And then I want to talk about some of the non-dental elements that can be influenced because of your dialogue with patients. And I mean, these are things that you may have not thought of. And then I want to learn how this methodology can increase your physician relationships and enhance those and increase referrals. And then I want to talk about something that we set up because we don't want you to have to keep coming back to seminar after seminar. We'd love for you to be able to grow with a collaborative group of us and that's the Wellness Dentistry Network, and I'll share some information with you about that as we close. And then I want to talk about a few of the visionary possibilities that we have if we could get some combined data from this network activity. So my practice has really taken on a new shape. Uh, we've transitioned this wellness practice model, and we started just by looking at the mouth, but then we learned not too far into our journey that this person really has a greater overall desire for wellness. They really want great balance and wellness in their lives, and we can help them achieve that. And I can tell you and share with you that there's no better allied health professional than you that has considerable face time with your patients, where if you start to talk about a few other things about their health, they will be amazingly receptive and view you differently. This information started to come to us uh, in a, uh, the significance of overall health, I should say, started to come to us way back in 2004 with the uh, Time magazine, which was set on to the entire public about inflammation and how inflammation links to a lot of other things. And then in a the more recent work by Jack Callum, The Inflammation Syndrome, which I would advise all of you to buy this book and set it on your, uh, on your operatory shelf, um, starts to talk about how cardiovascular disease is being redefined as a, an inflammatory disease of the blood vessels. And what do we know about that? We know by the picture on your very right that the mouth is a great contributor, can be a great contributor of organisms that can help enhance and uh, affect the system. This is what we want to prevent in practice. We think and we work with physicians that think this can be prevented. But every 34 seconds, somebody has a heart attack. And every 41 seconds, somebody every 40 seconds, somebody has a stroke. And we have a new Vietnam every month in the United States to heart attack and stroke death. And this can be totally prevented. And one of the things you can do in your dental practice is start to learn the risk signs of people who might be at early risk for heart attack and stroke and start discussing some of these things with them. This is the paradigm that we have to get past. It's, uh, it's so common because this is what patients think we do. They think we fix teeth. However, uh, they also think that we're not the people that can make them better. But we're really happy today that we can change that paradigm. And not only can we make them better, but we have a significant role, and they trust us. Uh, they trust us, and we have time with them. So it's a great opportunity. As a matter of fact, I don't know how many of you uh, have passion for the overall wellness concept. And in fact, Danny, if you could, I wouldn't mind finding out uh, what people think about that whole passion issue for the wellness concept. I wouldn't either, and it just so happens I have a handy-dandy poll question queued up, which I will go ahead and uh, ask our attendees to answer, which is quite simply, let's launch it. Oh, just a second. And Danny, while you're doing that, uh, let yeah. me know when you get the results. But you know, sometimes I use a tagline, dentistry for total body wellness, the tagline of the integrative oral medicine practice. Mm -hmm. And people don't know. They say, what's total body wellness? I don't really know what that means. How I would explain that to them is physicians do a very nice evaluation and review of systems when they go, when they evaluate a patient. 
However, if you ever look at what positions right when they come to the head, eyes, ears, neck, throat, and mouth, it's usually very limited information about the mouth. So I know that you can be you can be healthy and have uh, you can be sick and have a healthy mouth, but you can't be healthy with a sick mouth. And so the dentistry for total body wellness and the wellness concept uh, has to do with um, looking at overall health. Danny, let me know when you. I will. Have We've that. launched it. We're not seeing voting, so I think we have to push another button here. We're just, uh, uh, but I think your explanation certainly helped. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I had it. All right. So it looks like we've got 76% of all attendees having voted. We're going to go ahead and Good. close out the poll now. And uh, not surprisingly, a full 81% of those in attendance uh, do indeed have passion for this concept. And 19% uh, are not sure. 0% well, have said no. And I think that's, uh, I think you can help everybody. Yeah, well, why it's important is because if you're going to start to have other health discussions in the practice, um, you need to have a little bit of passion, or somebody does. And the reason why is they hear it in your voice. So we need to have some passion, uh, and we need to be able to help people with lifestyle management. And believe it or not, I have patients in my practice who wear activity trackers, and I help coach them uh, in other things for uh, for for some uh, for some physio or for some uh, exercise physiology. So we also have to understand risks risk-based treatment planning. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that means in risk-based treatment planning. And we use risk assessment tools. You're going to be very familiar with some of my risk assessment tools before the end of the uh, session. And we are concerned about overall health as the main objective, not just tooth repair. I'll very often have patients come in with a tooth-specific problem. And I want to reiterate that it's very important to always address someone's chief complaint at that first, uh, or chief concern at that first visit. However, um, we make sure we interject some other information about how that relates. And then we have to study a little bit of medicine. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, one course away from having my fellowship in anti-aging medicine, and it's important to study a little bit of medicine because it takes us to some new horizons. And then this is a key piece, searching for metrics. We like to really measure what we do, and one of the things I would encourage all of you to do, if you're getting great results in the practice, find some measurable that you can use to, de to develop some metrics so that we can put some uh, math behind uh, our success. And then we have to do marketing. Yep. Got a question for you before you go on. Yeah. Uh, just tell us a little bit about this uh, fellowship in anti-aging medicine. What is it? How long does it take? Who offers it? And uh, Yeah, it's, it's, it's done through uh, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Um, the Functional Metabolic Institute has a program. People can go and take courses uh, and they can um, it um, can be between ten and fifteen thousand dollars and you go and take these courses. And you're, uh, they're, they're uh, usually weekend, four-day courses. And there's a series of them, depending upon where you are. But uh, dentists can join. And we're actually trying to put a program together for some of those groups. So it's, um, if, you know, and I'm be very happy to share more should someone email me. Yeah, I would love to learn more about that. That's fascinating. And, uh, you yeah. know, I better, do, I better do it before I get too much older. Uh, that'd be a good idea. Yeah. So, and so we have to have we have to have this this interaction with physicians, which is great, and uh, and sometimes we have to adopt things a little bit early. Um, but if I uh, what I'm here to do is help hold people's hands, so we can nobody has to adopt anything early, kind of on their own. And then obviously we have to understand the significance of this inflammation and this cumulative inflammatory burden. And here's the challenge: you know, we have great face time. The challenge is what tests are we going to do or use in our dental practice? Because there's a lot of things that the market's throwing at us right now. Uh, we know we can save people, if we do screening in the dental practice, we can save people tons of money, um, but we have to be careful and we have to have a well thought out strategy for how we utilize some of these things. And I think you can really um, benefit by focusing on some of the most widely accepted disease uh, links, and that's going to be heart disease and diabetes. And remember that many of these diseases can be hugely affected just by a little bit of lifestyle coaching. So it's very important to do that, and we talk. Uh, to patients that are open to hear about it, we talk about hydration, nutrition, obviously sleep, not only sleep hygiene, but sleep apnea and other airway uh, disorders, uh, exercise, stress management, um, pollutant exposure. Uh, and I live in uh, Michigan. We have wet basements. We have uh, quite a few people who have mold exposure and other pollutants here in the Midwest. Um, dentistry uh, sees more patients than medicine on a more regular basis, so about 20% of your patients 
are not seeing physicians regularly, so you have a great opportunity. I started this journey as a lab tech. Uh, went to University of Michigan. I'm going to go through this quite briefly. And then went to a VA hospital. I worked at the VA hospital in a hospital dentistry program uh, back in 1996 to 1997. And then a small private practice in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And that's where I still am today. Um, where my growth really started to happen was at the Coy Center in Seattle. And for all of you, um, I am a little bit biased. I'm a faculty at the Coy Center. And um, John Coy has been uh, his genius piece was developing a risk-based um, examination process that allowed us to know where to spend our energy. We need to spend our energy on gum disease, cavity risk. Uh, where do we need to spend our energy for the patients? And let's not do for them what, uh, you know, let's not do procedures for them in areas where they don't have risk. So the Koi Center is a great experience. However, the black box says that the Koi Center's mission is still advancing dentistry through science. And it's a didactic program and advances in aesthetics, implants, and restorative dentistry. I don't see anything in that mission statement about health and wellness or about how to uh, go into a more wellness practice. And I hope that that's what I can bring uh, to the Koi Center. I can build on what John's already taught a lot of us, and that is um, his patient evaluation system. And we've really, that's the foundation of how this works. And uh, we do have some course offerings at the Koi Center that I'll mention toward the end. So the bottom line in periodontal disease management was I had to get this team of people that work with me. And I had to get them to represent some kind of policy in periodontal disease. How were we going to handle it? What were we going to do? And um, it's significantly improved the health of everything around me, my patients, my team, and my practice. And today, these discussions of health in the practice have gone way beyond the mouth. Um, it's, uh, and it's, it's created value for our service, expanded our awareness. And I can tell you that periodontal disease and sleep are probably two huge areas where you have uh, great opportunities to have springboard conversations. You know we have all kinds of other policies in the practice. You probably have a new patient policy. You, knew, you know you have some kind of policy around broken appointment. And I want to talk really briefly about what does it take to make a policy. But what I also want to uh, mention is the policies that we use clinically and how they develop. The COI Center really broke the somatonathic system into perio biomechanics, things that structurally attack the teeth, how the teeth fit together, that would be function. And then the last one, dental facial, is how the teeth look in the face. Um, I took those and extrapolated them out and just broke them up a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, divided them a little bit more carefully. And uh, so obviously periodontal, we call gum disease. Um, cavities is part of biomechanics. The other part we call biocorrosion. But biocorrosion is really a combination of this term. I've been using this term a little bit incorrectly. Um, biocorrosion is really, uh, in, in our practice, it's an accumulation of erosion, abrasion, and uh, attrition from something other than teeth rubbing together. So if people have these cervical notches or non-carious cervical lesions, we know there's a, there could be three or four things contributing to that lesion, and we want to address those in our wellness exam. The other thing is bite disease. Uh, that's what we call function. And obviously, we've broken oral cancer and sleep apnea out as two separate pieces and then appearance. And these are the seven key elements that we use in the integrative oral medicine approach when we evaluate the patient. So the practice is, um, again, focuses on these. And gum disease and cavities are the only two of these seven key elements that are caused by bacteria. All the rest are caused by something else. However, we can have some corrosive things from enzymes and organisms, but that's gets into a little bit deeper science, and that's not for tonight. But this is, an easy, uh, this is an easy way to break your exam into these seven areas and have some kind of graphics to help the patient understand what it is that we're talking about. And it'll come clearer as I go through and talk about these each individually. So when we develop a policy or a system in our practice, we have to agree on what we're going to do with the policy and what we want the policy to stand for. In other words, from a leadership position, you have to share with your team, what do you, what do you want for your periodontal patients? What do you want for your cavity patients? And we want to decide also what kind of tools are we going to need to enforce this policy and what are the steps and who executes that and what's the what, what do we measure? And these are some of the things that we, uh, as part of the Wellness Dentistry Network, we're trying to lay out the foundation of who does this because this is now starting to get into implementation. How do we actually make it work in practice? And we need to have a clear uh, methodology for how we do that. 
So this is the anatomy of a policy or a system, any kind of system about anything. Uh, it could be your gum, or it could be uh, an administrative policy or a clinical policy. In addition to that, what we have to have in order to successfully implement this policy, we have to have leadership. We have to somebody in the practice has to state what they want, and it could be the lead hygienist, it could be the practitioner, it could be the best communicator, it could be the dentist spouse. Uh, you know, you've all seen it. Uh, we don't know who the leader of the practice is, but that leader of the practice needs to state what they want for the patient. And then we have to have disease awareness for the patient and the team. We have to have diagnostic criteria. What is it that we're going to use? How are we going to diagnose the patient? And then how are we going to educate the patient? Because I can't take time and tell every patient, talk to every patient for 20 minutes about gum disease. And we want to take these diagnostic conversations and these patient education conversations out of the hygiene room. We don't want to burden our hygienists with any more stuff to do. So we want to create escape routes for these discussions to go on in consultation rooms, learning labs, some other methodology. Uh, but we don't want to have to have the hygienists. These hygienists do a lot of work. In our office, they're periodontal therapists. They do a lot of work in an hour, and we really need to uh, lighten up the load in there if we can. And then treatment, how, what kind of treatment do we do, and then how do we maintain the patient? These are all things that we're going to go through, and these are all key elements of each one of these uh, seven key elements. It's, these are key pieces of each one of these elements. So the relationship to uh, whole body inflammation and heart disease and diabetes, gum disease is a huge opportunity for us. In cavities, we talk about pH. We talk about, obviously, food choices, microbial balance. We also have a heart disease link, um, but it's not well known. And then in, for these biocorrosion or non-cervical carious lesions, we can talk about reflux, obviously, xerostomia, saliva buffering, abrasivity and type of taste. And just giving you a little smattering of things we can talk to our patients about by focusing on these areas. We know we have to have teeth to eat good food. And so we can talk about gut bacteria. We actually do gut testing in the office for some people. And then, uh, obviously, oral cancer and sleep disorder breathing. Uh, I think you know some of the links already. This is a really sharp group. And then appearance is separate. We don't think about it a lot, but I have some patients come in wearing surgical masks because they don't want us to see how they look. And uh, that person's going through a lot of stress from that. So appearance is also uh, contributes to uh, whole body health and whole body uh, inflammation because stress is a killer. And I think you've heard about that before. So what are some of the barriers to setting up a policy and uh, setting up uh, uh, these clinical, and how we handle these clinical key elements? Well, one of the things, obviously, in the leadership uh, area is lack of vision. In other words, you haven't stated what you want for your team. And so I encourage you to write down, be very specific, what you want your patients to look like in each one of those seven key areas. That's your vision. And then you might not support the team. It's very, uh, this is a leadership uh, mistake when your hygienist or periodontal therapist really cues up treatment and you walk in and say, oh, it's, um, it's okay, we'll see them in six more months. That's just a disaster for your uh, clinical team. And then, believe me, they don't forget that. And they, uh, they stop making the recommendations after a while. And then if you have the inability to delegate, if you have to do everything, you have the inability to delegate, that's a problem. And then we have to have some accountability systems because sometimes people don't do what we ask them to do. And E is one of my favorites. I hear this all the time when I go on the road. My hygienist won't cooperate. Well, I can tell you that's not a hygiene problem. That's a leadership issue. And so I'm going to encourage you to, uh, and I, we have ways of uh, helping uh, people see, uh, see the light. And then I can't make money discussing other wellness issues. That will come clear as we get later into the program. And then this is a big mistake if you believe that health-related issues are best left to physicians. Because I can tell you that physicians are spending on average five to six minutes with patients, and we are great people. If you have some leadership and you can direct this in your practice, it'll be amazing. This is an example of leadership in perio. Uh, in my practice, we have a very defined criteria for bleeding. Uh, if we have more than a certain amount of bleeding, I, it's mandatory that step one happens. You have to discuss the significance of bleeding. And then if the patient's concerned and wants the disease stabilized, then we're going into a data collection mode. We're collecting bacterial information. We might have genetic information. We want to know what modifies the risk to this disease. But this is a this is a, a check, basically a check sheet of what we do when, when somebody walks in and their periodontal health isn't like we want it to be. And then and then again, I want to reiterate: the only reason we would collect microbial data is that they want the disease treated. Just like when somebody comes in and says, "I want comprehensive dental treatment," you know, you might not take 20 photographs on everybody, but you might do a different workup if somebody wants treatment. 
And then if they don't want the disease treated, then we need to set them up with some kind of enhanced uh, bacterial load control system, whatever that is, go to electric brush, you know, water pick over floss, whatever. We have to do something, but we can't just let them go on that continual six-month cycle, bleeding and bleeding. That's just what we can't do. And we got to advise them if there's no improvement, then uh, we need to test or do some other things to get to develop a stabilizing plan. That's, an, that's a leadership example. Lack of awareness is another big one, and uh, there's some barriers to awareness. And it's, and it's if you don't train your team what to look for. They can't see what they don't know about. And so that's a, a big problem. And then we like to show and tell our patients a lot about what we do. And so we have very graphic pieces around, and these are all part of the network tools, but the papilla bleeding index, obviously our aperial charts, our assessment sheets, and our patient brochures, and then obviously how we relate that to overall health. These are things along the bottom that we'll talk about as we go through this a little bit. And this is a good example. Here's a case on the left. This patient is, uh, comes into the practice and has two, three millimeter pockets, no bleeding, but obviously this is not a prophy. It's surely not a prophy in my practice, but in many practices it is a prophy because you can't establish that there's active periodontal disease. However, this patient needs periodontal maintenance. It's clear to you. The patient on the right, there's no uh, recession. The, tissues at the CEJ, uh, we do a probe and they're bleeding all over the place. This patient needs active parental therapy, but in most practices, this is a prophy. So we really have to have some awareness about these different issues before we can make the proper diagnosis. And again, we use the uh, papilla bleeding index and we, I talked for two days about, or a day about just our periodontal disease policy, um, but it's a very detailed policy. And then everybody in the practice should be handing somebody some kind of little brochure and we have pieces in the network. Uh, how to educate patients about um, about their uh, significance of the disease. And I put this little pamphlet about periodontal disease on the screen because it's from the ADA. Everybody can buy it. It's really easy. And so it's an easy entry-level piece. And this is what one of the operatories looks like. And you see on the shelf, I have beta heart attack gene. I have inflammation syndrome, how to reverse and prevent heart disease, right next to our bottles of probiotics and some of the other things that we do. And if you look around in this operatory, it doesn't take you long to figure out that we're interested in more than just how your teeth fit together. And so that's what we want to do. And one of my colleagues has a book tower, which is on the right. This is in the waiting room. And you really want to display these things because it starts to, starts to establish your brand. So barriers to diagnosis. These are some common things that I hear. People say, oh, it takes too much time. Well, that's because we're trying to do too much in, uh, in one appointment. It really doesn't take too much time if your appointment becomes a data gathering appointment only and not a data gathering appointment and a profi. And then the tests are expensive. I can tell you none of these tests are significantly expensive. And if you're, and if you're uh, promoting health packages from $1,500 to $4,500 of services, I mean, you could give away the $120 test. So these are, these are bacteria tests, something I'm going to get into a little bit in a minute. And then uh, lack of confidence in the value of the diagnostic data. We can help with that, but there's a lot of value in the diagnostic data. And, um, and some people don't have clarity. They don't know what to collect. That's why we need some education. This is a big barrier. If you think you can't do something that insurance won't support, and I'm sorry that we need a PM won't, but if you're thinking you can't do something that insurance won't support, it's just not true. Um, you need to give the patient the option. And you know, many hospitals today won't even offer a test that's not in their network of covered services. And so people aren't really getting to make their own choices. And uh, we want to give people those choices. And then obviously lack of training about who collects what. And this is part of our diagnostic parameters for periodontal disease. You've already, I've already alluded to it. What I haven't alluded to is the risk modifier piece, which is in the middle of the screen. It's basically a checkbox system that allows us to determine what things modify the risk for the disease so we know when we need to treat it more aggressively. And then we collect microbial data on all active periodontal disease infections and it really helps, and then uh, we collect some genetic information occasionally. Um, but that's, a, again, a little bit of a different topic. Patient education, when we look at this, uh, we need a simple way to discuss this, and if you lack a simple way, then it gets really hard. I can't explain periodontal disease in a bunch of words, but I can do it with some graphics, and that's what the WDN is about. We've made a lot of different graphic pieces to help. And then it doesn't need to take long, because um, you can give literature and patients can go home and they can call you back. You can set up a separate consultation. And then I can tell you that patients uh, are concerned about their health because some people think that I don't need to educate them about that. They won't do anything anyway. You wouldn't believe how many patients have come back some time later and say, you know, I couldn't think about it now, but 
uh, then, but now I'm ready to talk about it. So never give up. And then I don't know what to say. This is super common. It's a great, it's a big barrier, and uh, that's why part of our teaching is having some of the words, not scripts, but having some of the words that you own that help you share your feelings with your patient. And then again, they won't accept what insurance won't cover, so it's not true. So one of the big lines for periodontal disease management for a verbal patient education that I use a lot is, hey, you know, you're bleeding much more than I'm comfortable with. It's not normal. And then they talk about why isn't it normal. Well, not only can it cause severe destruction to your teeth, but it creates inflammation. This inflammation, as referenced by some of these books that I have around, is significant to your whole body health, and it, in fact, can affect your vascular disease. And so it's really simple. And once you start going into that conversation, people change the way they think about what you're talking about. Barriers to treatment is, um, uh, for us to offer treatment, is we don't know what works. And this is where I really would like to ask people to start taking metrics. Uh, if you use some metrics, then you'll learn what works. And that's fantastic. And I'm passionate about our protocol because I have tons of metrics to support it. And uh, when I learn of a better way, I'll change it. But until I learn of a better way, I'm sticking with what I have. Um, and then uh, things, uh, I don't need proof. I know I, I have that clinical data. And then, again, certain parts aren't covered by insurance. We can't charge enough to make money. Uh, most, a lot of people are doing perio scaling for profi fees. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to get out of that. Um, but these are all barriers of thought. These are thought processes that stop us from uh, recommending the appropriate treatment. And maintenance is about the same. Uh, the biggest thing with maintenance is that many of us believe that patients won't change. Well, they will change when they understand the value of the, uh, of, the, of the significance of the condition. When they understand what the condition is really a disability, then they will change their behavior. But you're correct. If you don't make a, if you don't make a comment about it and they don't know about it, they won't change. That's perfectly true. And then we have patients coming in, uh, some on two-month recare, some on three-month recare, but we have patients coming in much more often than their insurance policy covers, and they'll do that if you give them the choice. And that's what I think you need to do is give them the choice. And you can do this in a very savvy way without uh, looking like you're selling things to patients. So it comes to how do we communicate our clinical findings and what do you do in practice. And as a matter of fact, um, Danny, if you, if you, I'd like to explain the slide maybe while you're queuing the, our second poll question, which is at the bottom. But, you know, how do you feel about how your office really communicates the meaning of the, uh, of the clinical findings when you do your exam or when your uh, periodontal therapists are discussing it with your patients? How do you, you know, how do you feel about that? Because I tell you, I felt bad about it. I, I never, I thought the information was overwhelming. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know where to start, all these things. And so these were the questions, you know, how do we, evaluate. Uh, I talked about that earlier. And how do we record the results of our evaluation and how do we communicate the meaning? And then well we've launched the uh, we've launched the uh, the poll, Doug, and okay. I can tell you just from years of communications and you already know this too. This is the uh, the frustration. Uh, I think everybody on this call knows how important this is. The challenge is uh, how and when to communicate the message in a way that uh, it will be received. So we are uh, we have 57% of attendees voting, having voted. We're going to give another 10 seconds or so. <clears throat> then we'll close the poll and uh, share yeah. the results with everybody. Yeah, and the, and the other thing, Danny, is this system, whatever you develop, it has to be simple. Um, it can't be too convoluted. And so, uh, you know, we created these uh, these personalized risk assessments that have graphics, they have a little explanation. And then we've created what we call a personalized assessment summary. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. But patients actually get one of these assessment summaries for each one of the seven key uh, factors in practice, and they walk out with it. And they walk out right. with it at the end of the hour and a half. All right. Well, we're just about uh, we're going to close the poll now and share the results with everybody. 63% uh, say that they feel they are. 8% feel Good. they're not. And 29% are not sure. So uh, you know, a nice cross-section there. and. Uh, you know, I guess the uh, the proof is in the pudding. If you're consistently having people say yes, uh, then uh, I think you're doing pretty well. If you don't get that yeah. sense, that's uh, that, that's why Doug is here <laughs> to help. Well, that's great. That's great. But there's still a little bit of room, it sounds like. And you know what, Danny? If there's yep. one person on this call that um, that I can help uh, change the way they communicate to patients, each one of you on this call, if you're a doctor, 
or if you represent an office, you might touch 1,500 to 3,000 patients in your practice. So if I can convert one of you, um, that would be that would make my night. Um, and even if you're the, effectively communicating, it doesn't mean that we can't be more effective. We don't sure. know. We don't know if we're. We may think that uh, that. 65% treatment acceptance is acceptable, uh, and then you, you break it down to the different different uh, protocols that you're recommending. You may see that you do well with certain presentations and certain types of patients, and with others, you're you're continually challenged. So there's there's usually room for improvement, I think. Yep, and then this is the study. This is a study that actually supports the fact that if we personalize risk communication, and when we do that. Uh, it really significantly changes uh, how the patient feels about what you're telling them and their ability to adhere to your advice. So when you have this clinical data and it's personalized, you really make them own it. Um, they feel like these things, these conditions are much more serious. They start to understand the, the, their susceptibility factor. They think that your treatment's going to be effective and they're going to be able to follow the advice and they feel really positive. And so that makes a big difference. And there's no question when you just tell somebody, oh, you have a four millimeter pocket, they don't know, or a six millimeter pocket, they don't know what that means. And when you start to communicate and personalize this information, it's really huge. So this is a study that supports the, uh, this methodology, and it's really been valuable. So the risk assessment, it's an, it's an awareness piece. We have these, you know, it creates awareness. It's a simple checkbox system. It creates awareness for patients and their teams about what we're concerned about with gum disease and, and if what are the risk factors that, uh, that might indicate that they have a gum disease issue. And what we really want to do is further develop these risk tools so that they're predictive. If somebody checks a certain number of boxes, then, you know, darn it, I want to make sure they have periodontal disease. And if they're checking the boxes and the risk uh, things say they have disease and they don't, then we need to change the question. So uh, we're, you know, we constantly work and refine that. But it gives these patients a great understanding. And this is an example at a wellness trade show. I was actually, we actually worked at a vegan uh, trade show. And the slide on the left is our booth. And those three of the risk factors are on one table. Three of the risk factor sheets are on one table. And then three of the risk sheets are on the other, risk assessments are on the other table. And patients walk by and they visually see these things. We have a vertical, vertical banner in the back, what's your risk, fill out our free risk assessment. And again, this is the, this is the nature of the integrative oral medicine approach. And patients absolutely um, migrated to this to this look. And then I'm so proud of uh, one of the doctors in uh, in uh, Rochester, New York, uh, part of our uh, early one of the early um, kind of the founding members that helped that helped me um, start to test some of the Wellness Dentistry Network tools. Uh, Sam branded these are all of our tools branded for his practice. And this is what we do when you uh, when you get engaged in the network is we brand these things for your practice and then they become yours. Um, but the concept's the same. And, uh, and the, the next piece, other than the risk assessment, two key pieces are the personalized assessment summaries. And these summaries are literally supposed to cover any possibility that that patient could have when, after your examination. And it outlines the uh, education and treatment management strategy. Now, it's not the treatment plan. For that, they'd come back for a consultation. But at least let them know there's an issue. It clarifies what oral health issue is important out of all these seven key dental elements, which are on the left. And it creates clarity about what kind of products, what kind of recare frequency, and what kind of procedure frequencies we should have for patients in practice. And I'll show one in a little bit more detail. And the key piece is it's personalized. It's specifically for them. And these forms are not designed to have the words perfect. They're designed for you to scratch things out, write things in. That's what personalizes a disease for them. It's your customization of some kind of walkout assessment. That's what really personalizes a disease for them. And this is an example of that. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, the top uh, paragraph on the personalized gum disease assessment talks about uh, the consequences that they have the condition. But then the boxes below start to clarify their current condition. An example, the top checkbox says you're currently free of gum disease. You should maintain your continuing care appointments at what interval? You write the interval in there that you want it to be, four months, six months, eight months, one year, whatever it is. Or the next box says you have evidence of past gum disease, but the disease is currently stable. You should have either continuous care, hygiene appointments, uh, every whatever, or you should have periodontal maintenance at whatever appointment. So that one case that came in with all the, uh, all the uh, bone missing, 
uh, that person would not be getting pokey services in my practice. They'd be on perio maintenance. This is the box you'd use to do that. And so I just wanted to give you an idea what these assessment sheets are, are about. And then further down, um, our assessment revealed you have inflammation that can contribute negatively to your general health. We recommend either returning, collecting diagnostic data, or come back for a comprehensive gum and bone exam if they said, uh, clean my teeth today, my daughter's got a wedding, um, whatever. We, you know, this is how these are used. And, um, and it gives them options uh, to discuss things at a separate appointment, not that appointment, not that day. And then, um, you know, you've elected to use a series of over-the-counter products. Um, there's all these choices around there, or based on our findings, we need to refer you. And so it's uh, well explained verbally and in writing at the, uh, at, at, our, uh, at the end of our uh, new patient exam. And uh, then if they have to come back, we do it at a, at a, a treatment consultation. So these are really nice. Now, one of the things that you know already, I'm a big fan of, uh, of the basic system that we learned in Seattle, but another key piece that Dr. Coyce taught me is the key concept of, which is a real key concept, is putting measurables or metrics to your work. If you could do that, then it's really great, and obviously we want to use evidence-based concepts in practice. So what are the metrics that we can use, and why should we use metrics? Well, the metrics are great because it just helps us measure all aspects of this disease management. Our diagnostic pieces can have metrics. Um, we can help to have metrics which help us determine if our treatment was effective. Uh, we have metrics that help us determine if our maintenance protocols are holding their stability. Um, we can accumulate metrics over time. Um, metrics can either prove or disprove a management strategy. And how powerful would it be if we as a group started to form some metrics together? And this is the power of a collaborative group like the Wellness Dentistry Network could be. It would be phenomenal because you could actually start to uh, gather some great data. And then metrics for the patient further personalizes the clinical data. Hey, here's your number, here's your record, here's whatever, and it really helps. And then metrics are really understood by physicians. They get pre-tests and post-tests. They understand the use of scientific testing to help guide treatment philosophy. And we just don't do that enough in uh, practice, and I want to be an ambassador for getting us to figure that out. And here's the additional opportunities that we talk about or that we have in practice or that are part of the module. Um, we have strategies for early disease detection for some of these main springboard diseases like heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, insulin resistance. And then uh, yeast management. Uh, yeast is becoming much more uh, prevalent as a considerable maybe pathogen. And uh, we have yeast management strategies for both the mouth, the sinus, and the gut, which are all kind of tied together. And then, obviously, some lifestyle things like hydration, nutrition, exercise, and stress management. And then supplementation is important. So we have a module on supplementation. And then exposure to both metals, uh, dietary pollutants, and then mold. Uh, we talk a little bit about that and have testing companies for that. All of these things have metrics tied to them. And then a little bit about compounding. We have that in the, in the uh, WDN, but it's, it's not a metric-based uh, thing. It's just different medicines that we use. So again, here's our uh, wellness uh, trade show booth, because this is now another key point. Before I get into the specifics of each one, um, we have to show people what we do. And so we have to market. This is the marketing part. We have to do a little marketing, and it's just gathering your team and going out and showing people what you do has huge, huge results. Again, this is our vertical banner, very graphic, easy to understand. Um, people get this when they understand they have risk. And they walk by the booth and they go, oh, I think I have that. And then you just start to talk to them about it. And uh, before you know it, you have a new patient. And then uh, different um, saying the same thing. Let me, let me interrupt you one second, Doug, about that if yep. I can. And, and so I'm mean, clearly that's that's what you would do or another uh, client practice does to promote their their protocols to patients in their community by attending health fairs targeting the consumer, yes. right? Yes. Okay. And do you assist with that? Do you help develop these uh, collateral materials? Yes. Yes. We have a whole, the, and part of the okay. Wellness Dentistry Network is a whole marketing module. And so that marketing module is where do you get the banner made? Where do you get the table throw? How, you know, the risk assessments branded for you. That's all part of the library of materials. That's huge. Yep. Yeah. Great. Yep. It works out, works out really well. Um, and then, obviously, your website, uh, which I'm embarrassed to say mine's a little outdated right now. We're working so hard on the WDN, the Wallace Dentistry Network website, but we've got to keep that updated as well. 
but they say it says a similar thing. It's kind of a somewhat of a uh, business card. And then it's four uh, months old. It's outdated, you know. I know. <laughs> and then and then these free thanks, Danny. And then these free giveaways are uh, very important uh, things that you do in the practice. And we put a bookmark. We have a bookmark with each one of our books. And uh, so when we give away one of these books to somebody who's looking at it or interested in it, then we stick a bookmark in it. It's a really nice, uh, nice deal. So I want to talk about uh, each one of these seven key elements briefly, each one, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the network. So gum disease, uh, you know, the gum disease piece uh, was uh, what I learned about in dental school was how to re uh, prevent tooth loss. Well, it's much more than that, as you know. It's the inflammation and its effect on systemic health. So that's the key piece about gum disease. And this is the current model of periodontal degrees, uh, disease progression. And when we go out and do one-day or two-day courses on uh, this topic, um, we like to create awareness, obviously, about the health issue, which we're doing here, and you know, your group knows real well. But the new concepts are working a lot more by measuring the microbial challenge. The microbial challenge is, um, uh, involves yeast and viruses, and it's the, uh, but however, it's the, not just the microbial challenge, it's the host immunoinflammatory response and how it reacts to the, to the microbial challenge, which I have limited control over now. We're starting to do more and more to be able to control that. But it's the host immunoinflammatory response that really determines whether this model goes on to connect the tissue breakdown uh, and shows clinical signs, or if it uh, stops and stays just basically isolated to the gingiva and gingivitis, or if it goes down and um, affects bone and we have actual bone loss. And so this disease is biofilm induced and host modulated. So if it's biofilm induced, the logical question would be: Are there a bill, is there an opportunity to have metrics? to measure the biofilm. And we know now that there are. And we use, again, we, we use uh, metrics uh, to measure uh, the biofilm. And in fact, the um, uh, DNA analysis, PCR DNA analysis, is used to measure biofilms. And we're getting several companies now that are starting to give us these testing modalities. Part of my job will be to sort out you know, the nuances between the companies and what does what. But uh, without mentioning names, we have several options for how to measure microbes. And when you set one of these personalized tests in a patient's lap, it makes a big difference on how they feel about what's going on with their periodontal disease. Uh, additionally, this is how it works in practice. You have a patient on the left that has high levels of pathogens, a lot of bleeding on the perio chart, as evidenced under the picture on the left. And then after treatment, uh, we have a changed microbial profile. Additionally, we have a clean perio chart. Uh, this patient starts to get the idea that, hey, this disease in my mouth is controlled by how well I control the microbes, and they get it. And we've done over 250 of these bacteria tests that have a significant impact on the patient. And what we realized was happening is not so much for just even the value of what the test showed, but how it helped us communicate and relate this disease process to our patients. And patients were all of a sudden relieved because they realized that they don't have periodontal disease because they're bad brushers. They have periodontal disease because they have a host immunoinflammatory response that reacts, and then they have biofilm on the teeth. And then so we've got increased treatment acceptance and a lot of opportunities to discuss other things. But the most fascinating thing for me was that uh, it takes about the, out of all the patients we've treated, it takes us working very hard about four and a half months to get our average patient to stability, which is uh, zero bleeding. So the metrics allowed me to learn that when I tell patients they're going through periodontal disease treatment, I don't tell them they're going to be perfect in six weeks or seven weeks and that I'm going to clean it up with a curette. It takes much more than that. And yeah, that's better to under-promise and over-deliver, you know? Yeah, and the, 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 metrics, pleasantly surprised. the metrics help me determine that. And then the metrics work in another way. When you do something, you do a procedure, and you don't get a chance, the you know, perio chart looks better, but the microbial profile doesn't change. If that happens, you know that patient's at increased risk to get right back where they were, and so it becomes a really nice uh, metric to help us uh, help them understand the significance of uh, maintenance. This patient uh, needs implants, obviously, so it's really nice uh, for the implant patient as well. And you can see there's obviously a slaughter of teeth missing. And uh, for this patient here, um, the pre-test on the top and the post-test on the bottom, I would just contest that the post-test is a much better environment for uh, implant placement. And then, so the, in the periodontal disease world, I can measure. 
I can use a perio chart, I can use a microbial profile, I can continue to reassess, and it's the topic of a couple papers. I published one in 2010 in Inside Dentistry and another one in uh, 2000, uh, or another one a little bit later in, um, in the Dentistry Today. I'm sorry, that just slipped by, but uh, they're available. Uh, these uh, books were all written by uh, doctors that understand the significance of uh, heart disease and um, and what heart disease has come down to as I as I said earlier is this concept or topic of vascular biology I'm gonna go back uh, just hit back on one side but it's this concept of vascular biology and what each one of these authors that wrote these books uh, uh, feel is that the dentist is a key player in uh, in part of the uh, heart attack and stroke prevention um, uh, program, and I think you know that from Brad Bale and uh, Amy Donine, or most of us do know that. So the biggest thing is, could it be beneficial to reduce inflammation in the absence of bone loss? And um, the answer for me is uh, resoundingly yes. Um, it's hugely beneficial. And what I want to do is just briefly, briefly talk about how we, a lot of us, have learned what a clean artery looks like and um, what. Uh, 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 an artery that doesn't have disease looks like, and it's pictured on the left there uh, at the very end in that circle um, has a very clean muscular layer and a single cell layer endothelium. And it starts if you start to build atheroma, that atheroma uh, can become vulnerable. It's held in by a little fibrous cap, and if you start to if you get a breach in that fibrous cap, you can have some fat that can spill into the vessel, and pretty soon you have a heart attack or a stroke. The nice thing is there's a continuum of biomarkers that can be measured, and again, i got to go back. I'm having just a hair of an issue with the computer, but it's not going to be a problem. I, uh, these biomarkers are, um, are measurable, and they help tell you uh, when things might be going awry. So we have very reliable biomarkers that we can use to measure and monitor. Uh, again, these are our metrics, and uh, we can measure uh, vascular elasticity and stress. Uh, we can, we can we know that periodontal disease is involved in these. So if we see problems with blood pressure, um, could be, there could be a periodontal pathogen that could be contributing to that. Uh, both endothelial dys dysfunction, HDL flux, the atheroma process itself. And then these biomarkers are uh, very significant in the, uh, in the measurement and process of, uh, of the disease process. The, um, this is a review paper, and all I wanted to say is if you look on the very left box at the bottom, it says a component of cardiovascular disease involves the innate and adaptive immune systems. Sounds like the current disease of, or the current model of periodontal disease. Additionally, it talks about how this whole thing is generated by bacteria. And this paper looked at, uh, this, uh, this paper looked at a review of over 97 papers that looked at how, um, periodontal disease affected the biomarkers, the different blood characteristics, antibodies, and lipids. And I can tell you resoundingly, it's conclusive that periodontal disease has an influence on uh, cardiovascular disease. And that's why I want to make sure that everybody uh, takes away from tonight. In fact, many of these papers have pathogens that are referenced by name. Um, if you look at the names of these, if you don't know what makes up the microbial profile of your periodontal disease patients, you would have no way to relate the possible risk to a systemic a potential systemic issue. And the bottom box on the right talks about how oral infection can be a risk for uh, Alzheimer's disease. It's a fantastic paper. And um, the next piece is you know that the uh, Brad and Amy um, Donine, who are the authors of Beat the Heart Attack Gene, um, they feel so confident about measuring the biomarkers and looking at biomarkers as an indicator of health and vascular wellness that uh, they think that this disease process can be totally extinguished. And so it's a fascinating way to practice, and I refer patients for cardiovascular evaluations all the time. In the uh, next slide, it talks about the significance of what we can see when our patients walk into our practice and sit down in front of us. And by looking at a dental history and a health history, these are all things that increase the risk of heart attack and stroke. And I want to share with you, uh, when you look at some of these, and for anybody that might not have a computer in front of them, it's really uh, things that you might not commonly think about, like psoriasis, um, stress and depression, uh, gout, um, if you have a rapid resting heart rate, and insulin resistance, diabetes, and obviously there's genetic components. But it's interesting because 
if you think about all these, there, and there's many more than this, but these are just some of the uh, some of the uh, entities that increase people's risk of heart disease. When you think about that, there's many of your patients that have some of these. If they have periodontal disease as well, then I get really concerned about their health. And that brings me to Joan. Joan comes into my practice. She obviously has periodontal disease based on her periodontal chart with all those bleeding indicators, but she also has diabetes. She's a little bit um, uh, thick in the midsection, increased adipose tissue, arthritis and rosacea, hypertension, a little bit of acid reflux, and obviously active periodontal disease. So we do some microbial profiling for Joan, but more importantly, I said, Joan, you have periodontal disease and you have several other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. I really think it would be good for you to have a medical evaluation. So I referred her out, and what I wanted to share with you is Joan's uh, report, this happens to be from Boston Heart Lab, and you know from looking at just red, yellow, and green that the results on the left probably shows there's some issues. But look at the report. This report, by the way, is 38 pages. So if you feel like giving your patient six or seven pages of information when they leave your practice or sheets or whatever is laborious, well, I can tell you the uh, other uh, people who are managing other diseases, you know, really don't think that. And this report's broken down into lipids, inflammation, metabolics, and genetics. Sounds again a lot like the uh, like the current model for uh, periodontal disease expression, and it's fascinating uh, these reports how simple they make they write the information out for the patients. So looking at that, uh, just to give you an idea how they write this out, the box on the very left says, "Joan, think of it like this: too much bad cholesterol is like garbage building up in the street, blocking traffic. The good cholesterol acts like strong garbage collectors and large dump trucks that pick up and remove the garbage, keeping the streets clear." And what also happens is right next to that page uh, is all of Joan's uh, lipid evaluation. And I'm going to circle that in the, uh, in the red. And here's Joan's lipids. And you can tell some of these lipids are very high. So she has the building blocks of atheroma, and she needs to be managed. If we move over to Joan's inflammatory bowel panel, it was terrible too. She has two of the biomarkers that we talked about earlier are significantly elevated. And the report says this. If your inflammation is not addressed, you have an increased near-term risk, one to six months of a heart attack or a stroke. I can tell you if you discover this for your patient, they think of you differently. And it's really a valuable thing, uh, valuable thing to do. But I put this in here because I wanted to show you how the heart attack and stroke world is uh, communicating with their patients. Looking a little bit just at cavities, again, uh, very briefly, cavities come to us in all shapes and sizes and different uh, different forms, but it's a really significant disease and it does have systemic implications. So uh, the, uh, and there was a, a paper written on the systemic theory of caries, but the whole idea is these cavity bacteria are roaming around as well and uh, they, they are significant in uh, the heart disease piece. And this is a paper that talks about uh, these cardiovascular specimens and people that have caries or have S-mutans that uh, these disease specimens are predictive. Uh, and have some of the strep mutans in them, so they're definitely floating around. Additionally, uh, this is how we treat and how we educate our patients. We have graphic pieces that explain this complex problem. So again, we have our risk assessment tools, we have our personalized cavity assessment, and then we give out uh, other things, but we have graphic pieces as part of the network to help the patient understand this process. And then there's a management strategy. Uh, before I get to the management strategies, I want to mention even in Dr. Kahn's book, A Local Cardiologist here in Detroit, uh, The Whole Heart Solution, he, uh, we do some fun things too. And he talks about how cavity-causing ca bacteria can eliminate the ability of your mouth to generate nitric oxide, uh, part of it. And so we even help patients with recipes and do other fun things uh, to help them understand the significance of cavities and what it might mean to their vascular health. And so. This is a, a, a summary of our management strategies. It's a very complex topic. We could talk about it for a, a long time, but we know cavities are it's a disease of susceptibility, and these are this is our network tool that we use to help patients select treatment options that they could use. Uh, we talk about the transferability. We talk about the things that are needed for the uh, for cavities to happen: uh, bacteria, teeth, food, and the proper environment. And in addition, uh, we talk about different treatment. Uh, for the teeth and uh, ways to modify the diet. Uh, but it's really nice, these are nice sheets that help patients understand uh, some of the things that they could or should do, and they have options. This is really, again, I call it biocorrosion. It's currently listed that way in our, in our network tools and 
will probably, uh, another nice thing about the network tools is as things change and evolve, we can change it. And in our network library, if, I, if we change the, a form, then everybody in the library gets that changed form. So it's really a nice opportunity. But this is about erosion, abrasion, and attrition. And what's happening here is it's this, um, this trilogy of uh, stress from chewing, friction from uh, attrition, and then the biocorrosion of this chemical wear. And it's the notching at the next of the teeth. We call them non-cervical carious lesions, and they can be filled, um, but they also can be managed. And they can be managed if we change the abrasivity of paste, uh, limit the acidic intake of foods, and uh, look at the stomach contents and things like that. So there's a lot of room for uh, topic discussion when we see these lesions. And again, these lesions come in all shapes and sizes, different ways. Uh, but again, a lot of opportunity for us to have discussion in practice. And we can fill these things. Uh, this is actually our work tool for bile corrosion. This is how we graphically explain to the patient uh, what this is. And again, we can fill them, we can monitor them, and we don't have a really good way of knowing how severe or how much these are growing. And, and uh, I'm really hopeful that our scanning uh, technology is going to allow us to really measure uh, what's happening here uh, for people. So you can tell somebody a year later, hey, your teeth are losing, uh, losing structure at the gum line and you need to have management. Uh, that would be, uh, that's going to be helpful. And bite disease, bite disease is really quite simple. Uh, bite disease, we can restore the bite to its proper functionality. However, um, you need to have teeth eat good food. And so this isn't about just restoring the teeth, but when you see attrition or loss of tooth structure, we have to ask ourselves, what is going on? Is it acidic? Uh, is it er an erosive or a chemical issue? Is it a frictional issue? You know, what's happening? And I can tell you the bite disease uh, part is very, very complex, and we have um, some basic tools for it, but I think that the best place to learn about occlusion are some of our academies. And the academy that I'm going to recommend is obviously the Coy Center in Seattle. We have um, two full three-day courses that are geared just to how the teeth fit together and the, uh, the proper working in the jaws and muscles of the face. And so it's a great, uh, that's the best place to learn about the mechanics of occlusion. And why is it important? Because, again, we need teeth to eat good food, and, you know, that hostess fruit pie, there's nothing in that hostess fruit pie that looks like an apple. So it's, uh, it's important to, uh, uh, and people that don't have good teeth, they, lend to, they tend to lean to these convenience foods and foods that, you know, aren't so healthy. Oral cancer is pretty simple. I really think it's a very, very complex, or it's a very um, important topic to discuss with your patients. And these lumps and bumps are coming in all different sizes and shapes. And so not only do we need to identify them, but your patients are going to really benefit from you having some kind of advanced uh, identification system. So whether it's an oral ID light or identify or some kind of immunofluorescent technology that allows you to determine if something else is happening. And this has incredible show quality for the patients. And that's part of letting them see what we do. They know we're looking harder, and um, we have a lot of comments in our uh, teaching about uh, oral cancer screening and the benefits to the patient's understanding of what it is that you're doing. Sleep disordered breathing is another uh, module, another uh, thing that we have. And you know the sleep disordered breathing is getting to be more and more recognized. And not only is it sleep disordered breathing, but it's airway development and airway management. And identifying these issues on children uh, at a young age is really important. And we have some home testing devices in the practice that we use, and these provide our metrics for, um, for screening. And then we refer to sleep physicians, and then oftentimes they come back. And then we continue to use our screening devices to, if we use a mandibular uh, positioning appliance, then we use metrics to measure the efficacy of uh, those appliances and how they work. Appearance, I don't need to say too much about appearance because uh, all I want to share with you is that when we have people um, that are 12, 13, 14 years old and have uh, developmental issues, it can create a huge amount of stress. And uh, this is a paper, uh, Melogenesis Imperfecta, but this paper uh, talks about the psychological impact of these de uh, developmental dental defects. And do not underestimate the stress, the insecurity, the uh, lack of socialism, that, the lack of social networking that people might have 
if they have appearance-related issues, uh, head posture, a lot of things because they're fearful or embarrassed to smile can create a lot of anxi anxiety and uh, depression for people. So appearance is important to evaluate and to ask people candidly how they feel. So again, these additional opportunities are all part of our uh, network tools and uh, just like we've created metrics and policies for how we handle some of these other disease entities or oral conditions, um, we're developing and continuing to grow in these, uh, in these other areas as well. And we're doing that with some medicine background and we're trying to have most of our stuff validated by either physicians or other people who are experts in those fields. This is a big question that I get all the time. Hey, you know, I don't really know how to monetize this idea. What do I do with this and how do I make money with it? Because that seems to be what a lot of people are interested in. And truly you can, you know, people are going to get healthier, but there is a large opportunity to monetize this and I want to show that. Um, these, I have a telephone interview sheet that I use from the Koi Center and what I have on the right hand side on these collaborative relationship building with physicians is these are actually the reasons patients were referred to me. HSCRP at 7.9, uh, myeloperoxidase is elevated, and uh, inflammatory biomarkers are up. Um, this person has an inflammatory illness disease. A cardiologist uh, referred somebody and said, I don't know what's causing the health problems. Can you, we're going to give you a blood report. Can you help us? Evaluate the mouth for inflammation. Uh, another doctor writes, the teeth are dissolving. I don't know what to do. And then another person came in for a mercury consultation. So as these collaborative relationships build, we know that um, it can be hugely beneficial for us. And these patients that come in with these problems, they have other oral-related issues that need service. And so this is how you monetize these, uh, one of the ways you monetize these relationships. And as a matter of fact, um, Danny, this is our, uh, the third interesting thing that I wonder if people want because, you know, sometimes physician relationships can be hard. People think they can't manage them. And you can, I'll explain this a little bit as you're polling. Uh, sure thing. The, We're going to go ahead and launch yep. that poll now. But, yeah, we, we want to just ask flat out, are you interested in collaborating and working with physicians? And as you said, uh, that's not always a, an open and shut question. I guess under the right circumstances, everyone would be. But let's go ahead and, uh, and see what our attendees. Yeah, yeah and in the say. network, Danny, we have, a, we have a Partners in Health page. And I actually want, I actually will call physicians and help them establish relationships with somebody in their community because um, we know what to do, we know how to approach them, and uh, we don't go to them and tell them what we're going to do for the patients. We actually have methodologies for asking physicians to help us care for our mutual patient, and it creates a, a total change relationship with, uh, with the physician. So we have been very successful approaching physicians and getting physicians on board with us. And they do come to the phone. They do not read letters, do not send a letter. Um, but they do come to the phone. They're very courteous. And they value what we do for them, especially when you use metrics and you show them how you treat patients. Um, that's right. really huge. Let me know, Dean, well, when you feel like it, I will. It's all in the way that it's communicated. And you know, I, in my work, I, I do hear from both physician and dentist. And it's funny that, that most often, I hear equally from each side that, uh, that the other side doesn't communicate with them. And uh, I, so I think a lot of that is just, you know, doing it the right way at the right time and, and, uh, yeah, and I think, speaking I think the language and using, using the, the medium that, that the recipient, intended recipient is comfortable with. Yeah, the goal that I thought for the Wellness Dentistry Network is if I have a physician listed in a Partners in Health page, that means somebody in the network is working with that physician and they're open for dialogue. So that's going to be the benefit, and we already have some people in Washington, and we have, uh, uh, you know, there will be people that we'll get that will agree to uh, to collaborate, and I hope to develop these relationships all over the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, as and we the, can see now, and, having and, closed and the, the yeah, and the world actually. Mm -hmm. Having closed the poll, the uh, the results are in. Uh, Fifty-three percent said they'd like to build a refer physician referral system. 29% said they have a referral system in place but would like to do more with it. And 18% they're not interested right now, perhaps in the future. Uh, we didn't have an answer, uh, I'm not interested right now and never will be. I suspect that nobody would have said that anyway. Well, some of these physician referrals can, can require that you have to write a letter. I mean, some of it can take a little bit more work, but I can tell you it's valuable. So this patient, Pat, was referred to me because she had elevated myeloperoxidase. 
And so she had a family history of heart disease. She had elevated myeloproxase. She had some other issues going on, dyslipidemia, obviously, um, uh, high blood pressure. She had sleep apnea that was not controlled. Uh, she was uh, inconsistent with a CPAP machine. She had acid reflux. Um, and so, and, and sometimes you can tell by the medications they're taking, kind of what they have. But her myeloprocess was elevated. It was up over 650 when she came to me in late 2014. And um, from a periodontal standpoint, if your concern was only about bone, she's a go she gets a gold star. Uh, so you're going to miss it if you're just looking at bone levels. And um, when uh, on her dental history, she actually wrote right on there, elevated myeloprocess. So that's what's circled in red, and that's why she came to me. And she considered her mouth to be in excellent condition. And uh, again, that was her main concern. So on our perial evaluation for her, we obviously found some bleeding, much more than I'm comfortable with. We did a microbial profile. Um, but when you look at her, you cannot diagnose periodontal disease with your eyes just by looking. And when we looked at her, she really looked pretty good. Um, but we went on to uh, treat Pat. And um, Pat, uh, also, before I get into the rest of the treatment, Pat also had, uh, was interested in learning, looking at an alternative to her CPAP. So we applied our sleep metrics and our sleep assessment, and um, we said uh, we had her further evaluated, and she was cleared to use a mandibular advancement appliance, and so we went ahead and made that. We used our sleep metrics you know, to monitor that piece for her. And what I wanted to do is summarize what happened to Pat um, but before I do that, this was her first visit summary. She thought her mouth was excellent, um, but she comes in, she has active perio, case type 3. We recommended salivary uh, saliva testing for the pathogen load, which she consented to that day. She had some biocorrosion lesions that we could just monitor. We didn't need to do anything. We changed her pace to one with low abrasivity and talked to her about acids in her diet. Um, we uh, suspected insulin resistance, so we asked her physician if he would consider a two-hour glucose tolerance test. He consented. Uh, we, she, we talked to her about the significance of increasing her exercise, the Mediterranean diet, the reflux management, and uh, magnesium supplementation. These are all little pieces that are part of the modules in the network. And her assessment said, as a result of your dental exam, we recommend periodontal treatment, reflux management, sleep apnea management to improve your sleep hygiene. We'll forward a copy of this report to your referring physician. And uh, please note, any changes in your health should be reported to us because it can change the risk. And so these are the these are, this is the personalized assessment part of it. And to make a long story short, we had some other recommendations for her. We explained her radiographic frequency, which is in the box on the right. This is the bottom half of her assessment. And uh, of a, uh, we have a final thoughts page as we do the assessment. We kind of summarize for them at the end. And then I said I'd have recommendations at the consultation and after I consult with your physician. And so it was really nice. We also did cone beam imaging for her to uh, rule out periapical pathology, and she had some crown and bridge work. And in fact, she cleared. So uh, and she didn't have anything there. So we completed the periodontal therapy. She's currently wearing a herpes appliance, doing very well. She's doing better with the acid reflux. She's increased her exercise. She's done some other things. But her myeloprocess in 2014 was 654, and as of uh, April of 2016, it's now at 310. Um, within the normal range. Pat spent $9,700 in the practice. So this is how you monetize this. Not to mention we have metrics, and we don't know if we were the one that uh, that got Pat's myeloproxidase to come down. But when I called her physician and said, what do you think? Um, you know, what, what made the big difference? And he said, listen, you know, we're treating her as a team. And I don't know who, I don't know what part was the most significant, but it's probably the result of a lot of little people. And, um, and I appreciate your help with Pat's care. So it's really, uh, really a nice, uh, rewarding relationship. Um, this was a patient uh, who came in whenever, when we ask a simple question, do you snore? If you do, it's an Epworth, it's a bed partner survey, and then we have another uh, nice questionnaire developed by Steve Lambert that talks about uh, how sleep's related to health. And we have the patient fill out these questionnaires. And this patient uh, ended up with a, uh, an advancement appliance, and I just want to share the initial, uh, initial data with the follow-up data, and his AHI went from uh, 7.4, he was really mild, to 4.5. And uh, more importantly than that, what I got back from him after he was done, um, and I shared these results with him, his snoring went from 21% to 5.9, and he spent $2,500 in the office. So not everybody spends a lot of money, but some people, in fact, do.
And Don uh, sent me a nice testimonial, and he basically said the box on the left says, I've been unable to sleep. I've had the, um, my mother and father and sister all end up using CPAP or BiPAP machines. And for the three years, his snoring became so loud that people didn't want to visit him. And then he says, my advice uh, is that anybody who snores should, he, this was nice for us, he said, see Dr. Thompson. He just said he's great at educating patients on the causes and serious health impacts of disrupted sleep. I thought it was nice for a patient to use the word disrupted sleep in the letter and then uh, presenting treatment options. So uh, he said he's doing really well. And these are nice testimonials that you get from patients. Um, Steve, uh, on the left, was referred by a chiropractor who said, I want to understand how, uh, I want a dentist that understands how to manage heart issues because he had had two stints. Uh, he spent $68,000 with a full mouth reconstruction in the office. Uh, Bill was referred for elevated HFCRP at 10.9. Uh, he spent, in addition to his periodontal disease management and caries management, he spent $37,000 in the practice. So these cases trickle in um, when physicians uh, you know, when they trust you and they know what you're doing. Again, I talked about these additional areas to promote wellness. Um, I've gone through these already, so I'm going to move past this. And here's some summary thoughts about this piece before I talk just briefly about the network. A lot of us understand how to evaluate and address restorative needs, but when you put risk profiles and you refine and relate oral health to systemic health, it really uh, changes the way they think. And it takes a lot of understanding. And so we've tried to create modules that put this into bite-sized pieces. And I think when you really take these diseases seriously, and you develop detailed policies about how you identify it, how you explain it, how you treat it and maintain it, it's super rewarding. And this, uh, this information, when you relate it to whole body health, it creates incredible trust and loyalty in the patient base. And then, of course, referrals uh, refer back. The physicians refer back. So, I want uh, different like-minded dentists to consider how these conditions um, uh, can lead in these wellness conversations, can lead to coaching and guiding. They can affect overall health with measurable biomarkers. And I think together we can prove that managing patients this way has measurable health benefits and it can save our patients lots of money and lots of unnecessary disease experiences. And how do you monetize this? You, if you're going to profit from the wellness concept, it comes from monetizing a reputation and a brand not a dental code. So we really have to get past that dental code uh, mentality. And again, why uh, there's three critical points about why the wellness movement is successful. And this is really significant, three things for you to think about in any of your endeavors. And it's really because it's unique, it's relevant, and it's true. And when you put those things together, you could have something really big. And so I hope that uh, people will consider being part of the Wellness Dentistry Network and help us all grow in this wellness dentistry concept. So I want to go ahead and um, explain a little bit. And you know we reviewed how we communicate these findings. I'm going to move past. You've seen this slide already with personalized risk assessments and personalized summaries, personalized assessment summaries. And we have a whole two-day course on this process. And I showed some research and some literature that supports how patients are moved when they hear this this way and how it's significant. And that's great. And I want to now just move to a little bit about the network, give you a little bit more data, uh, information so it's a little bit clearer for people. Um, also, uh, we do live courses at the Koi Center. This is a two-day uh, course, both November 18th and 19th and April 28th and 29th at the Koi Center. These courses are open to anyone. And uh, this is a two-day on not only periodontal disease management, but the whole wellness concept. Uh, wrapped into a two-day course, and I am a faculty at the Koi Center in all the course one and track one and two courses, although I have a very limited role, uh, much more limited role. These courses in November and April will be my courses um, that uh, we're going to be doing now. So the Wellness Dentistry Network, wellnessdentistrynetwork.com, um, we're just nicely getting this going. There's still some bugs in the system, but we're working it out. Uh, and what we are and who we are we're all independent practitioners. I'm not asking anybody to sign franchise agreements or join any kind of groups. We're all autonomous. We want to understand the relationship between oral health and obviously overall health. And then uh, we know we want to do more than just repairing teeth. And we're connected in principle. And we have this online learning hub, this online content that we're continuing to put together. And you've seen some of it throughout this presentation. Um, members learn how to execute the patient evaluation methodology. 
and um, it was optimized. Uh, we've worked on it a lot in the integrative oral medicine team with my integrative oral medicine team, and it's grown my practice significantly, well over 25 percent. And um, these seven key elements and these 15 other elements have been really uh, valuable. And the network's going to continue to grow. And the value of the network, I think, is, is continuing to grow with it. And if I get other people to help us, we can all grow together. Somebody shares a good idea, the whole group's going to get to see it. Uh, it's also a, net, a forum where members can exchange information, allowing them to stay current with uh, less uh, individual effort and time. So when you log on to Wellness Dentistry Network, if you're a member, I just gave you a little glimpse. This is our dashboard, and then the boxes are member directory, office forms, or tools library. This is where all the tools are. Uh, quizzes, test your knowledge. We're going to develop that out. There's a forum. Um, there's a whole module on marketing your wellness practice. There's videos, articles, and books that we've uh, referenced, and then implementation audio files. I have an audio file for most of the tools that we use and how we use it. And actually, um, when I... Uh, uh, go ahead in our Office Forms Tools Library, if you check on that box, this is what it looks like without seeing the whole library. This is 1 through 16, but when I forge ahead one more slide, here's all 23 boxes, and when you check on one of the boxes, what you see inside the box uh, when you click on that is um, your form or your tool that we use, an explanation of the form if you hover over it, and the forms are all broken down into either letters for patients or physician patient and team awareness tools, diagnostic tools, and treatment and maintenance tools. And some of these libraries are going to get quite large as we develop them and continue to grow them out. Um, why do we do this? I really wanted to reduce the uh, barrier and expense of this traveling to seminars and time away from home. I wanted to have something that was online. And I wanted to allow consistent updated material as it evolved, and I wanted it to be affordable. Um, some of these consultation uh, fees are unbelievable consultants and I wanted something to be affordable and I really want it to grow and I wanted the data I wanted to get some eventually get some collective data so we can validate more things I'm going to have people smarter than me figure out how to help me do that and then um, continue to define and refine these easy questionnaires that assist in this translational and transitional conversation uh, from dental repair issues to whole body issues and uh, network members uh, get this so how you join the network, I'm actually going to show you how to do it. It's um, Right now, we're not going to continue to have this, this fee at, at this price, but uh, we're just getting it going. So for $1,895 um, uh, initiation fee, and it's about, a thought, I think right now we're set at $1,100 a, a year uh, to continue your membership. Uh, this is what happens. But you would just simply uh, click on the, uh, on the uh, join link, um, click on the join link, and it will take you to the Wellness Dentistry Network join now. And if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a membership form. Click on the membership form. And here it is, the membership form. And actually, right now, I'm just taking membership forms. And I will actually call you personally and talk with you about your practice and what you're thinking about doing. And if you submit this membership form to us, then that will initiate the conversation. And uh, we'll call and work together to uh, get, you, um, get you enrolled and uh, get you started uh, in this. So I'm going to um, go back, Danny, uh, to that last slide. And we can um, open this up for the few minutes left to a little bit of dialogue. And I'm happy to field any questions uh, that might come up. Or Danny, if you have any comments about what I should do. Thank you very much. Well, I think you've done enough already. This has been a, uh, uh, but we're going to ask you to answer some questions. So you haven't quite done enough, I guess. But well, John, well, uh, job well done finishing. Uh, we've got. Seven minutes remaining, we had an unusually engaged audience today, Doug. I'm sure that, uh, that's a credit to the, the content and the, and the presenter. Some of the questions were asked earlier on, and I've tried to scan down them while still paying attention to you so that we don't take up time asking questions that I think have been more or less answered. Uh, here's a quick one. Somebody said, why, why must there be four or more areas of inline bleeding, I guess, to meet your criteria? I'm repeatedly hearing we should have zero tolerance for bleeding gums. Yeah, you know, every practitioner has to decide what they're comfortable with. And I, you know, patients, um, the zero bleeding could be, that would be great if that's your vision and practice and you decide to do that. There was so much disease in my practice. I'm embarrassed to say that um, all of my patients were profi patients uh, seven years ago. And when I started, I just had to pick a number. It's a random number. It's arbitrary. 
It's what I thought. I know if they have one bleeding spot, it, you know, I get it, it's inflammation, but I wanted to give people, I just felt comfortable personally that, hey, if you have five spots of bleeding, and I have some offices that say, I think it should be 10, and I have other offices that say it should be zero. It's personal. You decide what you want it to be, but quit, create clear vision for your team what you want. And in my practice, when I was starting to clean up an older practice, believe me, I had a ton of bleeding, so we set it at four or more. No science behind that at all. Totally random. Understood. You, you got to start somewhere. You got to be realistic. Uh, yeah, it, it, really, it, it, just, it, it just gave the springboard. It allowed the springboard conversation to start to happen. That, hey, you're bleeding more than I'm comfortable with. It's not normal. And it's, been, it's worked out really well. Okay. Filling out seven pieces of paper seems like a lot during the new patient exam. Do you fill those out or does the team do it? How do you get this you, information into the chart? You can do it either way. You can have your team, my assistant, my assistant knows when we're collecting the exam data in the first 30 minutes of the exam, uh, she knows already what we're going to be, what, that we're going to be talking about abrasion or we're going to be talking about acidic drinks. And so we have the support pieces of information that are coming. What I'm hoping you guys will have, every office that joins the network will be allowed to have four users in the office. So you could actually log online right in the operatory and you could click a print on a form and print it up front and they could pick it up up front. You could take somebody into another room and teach them uh, whatever, however you want to do it. But it's not, these are checkbox forms. These are strikeout forms. So these are really simple to fill out, and, and you get good at it. Now, believe me, the first couple times you fill them out, it might take you a little bit longer, but that's why we do it in courses. You know, we'll, we do it in the coursework, and you have to get comfortable with it. Additionally, these forms, we could, if we have input, we could customize them. We could uh, change them up a little bit. But, um, but it really doesn't take a long time in what it, what it does do is it totally changes the patient's perception of what you're doing for them. How we get them into the chart, I am an EagleSoft user, so I scan them and I save them as a smart doc. But this is an issue that we have right now. In the not too distant future, the Koi Center is developing a beautiful piece of software that will integrate and, uh, and do a little bit more of that for you. But um, I'm still paper forms right now. I don't have a way of, uh, of putting it in the chart. And so they leave with the assessment, we scan it, we put it in their chart, and we call it their, their uh, personalized assessment, and we refer back to it um, when we want to. We just open it up. It's a PDF. All right. Um, here's one. Can we, uh, can we assume you set aside standardized antibiotic stewardship guidelines when treating identified high-risk pathogens in confirmed high-risk patients? Will guidelines ever be rewritten for the adjunctive and prophylactic use of antibiotic therapy? I assume that's what well, ABX is. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, we really treatment. even would prefer not to use antibiotics. However, if you start to use metrics to measure the, bio, the biofilm change, I have not been successful without using some kind of antibiotics for my disease patients. I am not suggesting that... Um, you know, I'm not in conflict or trying to be in conflict with the American Academy of Periodontology. Uh, that's not what this is about for me. This is what, what I'm trying to show people here is what's worked for me in private practice and what works for me in private practice. And the antibiotic guidelines are not going to be rewritten until they have the right randomized control trial studies. And I don't know how they're going to do that because there's so many moving pieces in periodontal disease management and complicated co-collateral uh, co, uh, risk factors. These are very, very hard uh, studies to do, and I can't wait for that. I want to get my patient's profile changed now, and so we, uh, so we use, um, you know, and we use antibiotics very judiciously. We call each physician of everybody we use, and we support every patient with probiotics. And that's a topic Katie, that could be a that could be an hour discussion, right? You know, right? Yeah, now. I, I know. We, well, you and I talked, touched on it a little bit briefly while we were preparing for this. Uh, I think Trisha. And, and I'm not and I'm not an expert in microbiology, by the way. Well, this is the age of specialization. You know a lot, but yep, there are people I'm sure that you defer to. Uh, here's a question which I, I mean, you've implicitly answered it, but specifically, where do sugar and fermentable carbohydrates fit into your wellness plan? Sugar and carb consumption will dictate biofilm formation. Yeah, the uh, one of the books that we have on our shelf and that was. Um, I'm not sure if it was in the book slide, but it's uh, SOS. It says uh, stop only sugar. Um, we think sugar and fermentable carbohydrates uh, are responsible for candida overgrowth. Uh, we think that um, sugar is a big problem. And so when we have patients that want to do one thing um, that might really affect their health, 
and uh, and they're involved in eating uh, refined sugar, uh, we really try to help them uh, eliminate that because that's a huge that's a huge thing. We know that and remember, you know, if people don't eliminate it, we can at least help them moderate. And, uh, right. and it's one of the things. That, it's one of the things that we could have a role in future activity tracking. We, you know, in some of your nutrition apps, uh, they track uh, indulgences or sweets. And um, so, if there were, if you want to do some some health tracking, you could help patients uh, monitor that. Yeah. But we have different strategies, and, and it's important. Excellent. Do you? Uh, let me just ask. Uh, do you? Uh, do you talk about xylitol much to your patients? Absolutely. We have a xylitol fact sheet. Um, we are very respectful of the work that L.A. Phillips has done. Um, xylitol is an important part for those that can tolerate it, and for those that can't, we have we dissolve xylitol in water picks for people that don't want to swallow it. And uh, xylitol is a big part of the uh, of the practice, um, you know, of these. And, you know, believe me, to give to give the, each one of these little disease modalities three or four minutes uh, doesn't do them justice. Uh, we're but we're right. Uh, and we and we like to continue to learn from you. That's the idea of the network. You know, we can we can you know, especially if you can put some metrics to it. You know, if you can put some metrics to it, and uh, you know, other than to say I think they look better or they're bleeding less, that doesn't really tell me a whole lot. And you have some kind of metric that we can use and say, look, I took this many patients, put them on this. This is what happened. Um, that that would be beautiful. And I think we're going to have cool, neat ways in the future of measuring biofilm, uh, both biofilm energy (ATP) and uh, other things about biofilm that will help us understand it more. All right, buddy. That's all we've got time. There are a lot of questions. Uh, I will send them to you, and then you can answer them offline. Uh, okay. I loved your presentation based on how many people stayed on and, and signed up in the first place. I think I'm not the only one. I, I particularly loved your emphasis on the importance of policy formation and the consistent implementation and leadership and overcoming those barriers. And uh, I think another v big value add is the um, the exchange, the information exchange forum you're talking about. I think that's going to going to add to successes because people can share their successes and their challenges. Uh, I assume both clinically and managerially, correct? Yeah, no question. And I just ask people, you know, this has been a big work in progress, and we're just developing. So people that want to come on again, we're not going to. It's probably not going to be at that fee. Um, you know, for long, but I want to. You know, we got to grow with it. We got to start somewhere, and so we're in V1 of the WDN network, and we're uh, we're looking forward to really uh, trying to help some people, and that's why it's at a very very affordable. Fee. Um, I don't yep. want. I'd rather give people a little bit more, um, and you know, but as it develops and as we learn the validity and the value of it, then we can uh, we can expand it more. Yeah, so I think it's pretty thing? clear that it's. It, I think it's pretty clear that it's a great value. Uh, and that the reason you're doing it is to encourage people to get started in, in the proverbial ground floor. So uh, I think it's great. And again, I want to thank you for that really highly comprehensive presentation and for sharing such a simple way for practices to actually implement integrative oral care for their patients. 